Live from our newsroom, it's the Hard Times Podcast. With Bill Conway and Matt Sangum. All right. Uh, Ray, welcome to the Hard, Hard Times Podcast. It's oh, you don't even know the name of our own podcast uh, anymore? Whatever, the Hard Bill, Times Podcast? Hard Times! Coming your way. How you honored been? To be, honored to be here. Good. You guys, uh, you're doing good work out there. Oh, much appreciated. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, last time I saw you was probably a year ago, maybe a little less, at Gilman. You two today... Um, playing Gilman for the first time since I think when was it the, the last photo the, the photo from the disengage record mm-hmm the guy with the mustache stage diving <laughs> one of my favorites <laughs> like how do you ruin a hardcore photo how do you ruin the best <laughs> hardcore photo ever taken throw a guy in there with a mustache screaming I guess people have mustaches now but back then it was like an unheard of <laughs> um I had heard a friend of mine had told me that when you did today came to Gilman before that show, uh, that you guys were treated pretty rough, that they had like thrown yogurt at you or something like that, that they were, people were pretty upset with you to today. The first time you guys came to Gilman. Do you remember anything around that? I think the very first time, well, no, no, no. Very first time we went three yogurt at us. I missed that one. Here's the deal. I'm also old. I can't necessarily remember a lot of things, but I think uh, I think Gilman went from being this like sort of projecty type of space for like anarch anarchist maximum rollers to like a regular club mm -hmm. where there was no um, affiliation with anything. So I think at first maybe we might have been questioned. Our buttons might have been pressed. We probably got the same treatment in shelter. Because mm -hmm. the first time Shelter toured it was a very, it was a very old Shelter lineup that played at Gilman. Um, I think we might have got some pushback then. Like I can't truly really remember, but you know, I was part of the fun back then. We try to push buttons, they push our buttons. We push back, they push back. That was part of the game of sort of like either peeing on your ground or like making your statement, and everything yeah. was always like a debate. Yeah. It's fun to look back at it. Um, I always wondered, like, uh, do you think part of the – what do people have more of an issue with? The physically strong, morally straight youth of the day, you know, where it was like we think, you know, being in good shape is important? Or did they have more of a problem with the monk stuff? What, what pushed the punk's buttons more? Well, that's a good point. Um, I, I will say a straight edge infuriated a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Like, especially because in the early days of the straight edge scene, nobody was straight edge. There was a couple people left over from like, oh yeah, I love minor threat. I'm straight edge, but it wasn't like a scene. But when it started becoming like a, like a building scene, the people who were into punk. I mean, I grew up into punk. It was my thing too. I didn't really, ex I didn't really expect it to become a bubble within a bubble. Because because the punk scene was a bubble compared to mainstream rock, and the straight edge scene was a bubble within that bubble, and so I didn't really think it would be a bubble in a bubble. I just thought we'd have an integrated scene. It wasn't like that whatsoever. It it created a community where people would come and buy a, you know, the people would buy a Wide Awake record. They have no interest in buying a Addicts record, or they had no interest in buying a non straight edge band record unless mm -hmm. they sort of like. Or disguised straight edge band like Blast, like they're probably straight edge, you know, things like that. <laughs> but there was no crossover. Whereas in the old days, you you bought any record that came out. I had the False Prophets, the Misguided, the Heart Attack single, the Kraut single, the the Mob single. I'm just naming New York bands. The Antidote single, the Agnostic Front single. You just had all of it, and it was just and one. These guys were full on punk rockers. These guys were like. You know, every, everybody went from far left to far right, and you didn't care. It was just like weird misfit music. It was, we were the misfits. Mm -hmm. Anybody who was part of that scene in the old days were like a bunch of weirdos, a bunch of misfits. And you found camaraderie in that um, misfits thing. Now, truthfully, that's the thing about the... Um, politics didn't play much. And even the bands that were into political things they, there was a, a way that they actually just related they had their thing and then they had their 
personal lives. Nowadays, mm-hmm. if you're a Democrat or Republican, you're at each other's throats. There can be no personal conversation. But back then, we were almost united by our freakness. Does that make sense? Yeah. United by freak, united by freakdom. So when Stratish came along, which was very clean cut, very, and I didn't plan this at all. And I didn't even necessarily think it was a good thing. It became a scene within a scene. You were just interested in other straight edge bands. There could be a great band out there, but if they weren't straight edge, people wouldn't buy that record. Mm -hmm. So that sort of was a little sad. There was not that much integration. So, um, so that definitely pushed people's buttons. We definitely got pushed back, yelled at, hated on, um, ostracized it's kind of and fun then, when you leave the show and you're in the van and you're all laughing about it afterwards though right um it depends if it was like a fight it was, mm-hmm. if it was like a physical <laughs> confrontation or just like a hamburger on your windshield <laughs> and then the krishna thing was just so bizarre for most people i mean nowadays like krishna and bhakti it's a very you know i i teach it in the in the yoga scene it's not that it's not as weird and culty anymore because most people don't live in an ashram. Most of the community that are into Krishna are family people, people with families and stuff like that. So I, I'd say from my time, from like 88 back to like the sixties when the Krishna started in the West, it was very culty. Mm-hmm. So you have basically fr- more freaks, <laughs> but, 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 but they're so far I mean, plus before internet. So, mm-hmm. you know, we didn't have many, people looking in walking out around in robes it was just a very it was more weird freaks and you and you can f- spin that into well they're a cult and the, and we know of other cults there's jim jones there's all these cults out there this is just another cult so it was easy for that thing to spin out of control especially with the original um ideas ethics of punk which is you know anarchism socialism there's no god in control it's all we just do whatever we want and then some, all of a sudden someone's talking about rules and we c- control our senses. But it, th- it did sort of play easy with straight edge because straight edge is controlling your senses, control, controlling what you put in your mouth. Control, mm-hmm. it, it's at least it was supposed to be. Um, so anyway, punk was another, I mean, Krishna was another completely weird oddball to add to an already oddball mix, which is why some people would be like, okay, weird. Okay, Krishna, whatever, you know, and, and, and some people it resonated with, some people liked the music, but like never. And then some people would be like, this is just repulsive. I love it, dude. That's when uh, I saw Shelter in Berkeley. We, we helped promote that show too. At, Thank you, Hard at Times. Like a, at like a, was that, was that like a half bar place, which is fun too. It was like the, I forget what it's called, would, like brewery or whatever. Um, I remember, it's fun. Man, when the lights go out and then there's chanting and then there's like incense there's burning. magical happening, isn't and it? And then the music hits. Holy shit, was that cool. It's, a great, I, <laughs> it's a great intro. You know, that's um, ancient. It's actually ancient chanting. Um, they, they say it's before recorded time, these, these mantras. It's some mm-hmm. of the oldest prayers. And the Sanskrit language is so beautiful. It's basically like chanting in Latin, but it's all beautiful poetry and prose. And this very weird pitch that almost sounds like it's not from this planet. Mm-hmm. I'm dying, 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 you know? And so then when that comes in with the incense is burning, it's like, where am I? It's got that, you know what makes punk great? It, it's when it gets a little scary. Mm-hmm. When it gets a little weird, like what the hell is about to happen here? Who are these guys? <laughs> you know, like the misfits get on stage or agnostic front, you know, in the, in the day and stuff like that. There was always an element of like, this is scary. And that's I sort of maybe, maybe what attracted us to punk. I remember my, first hardcore show ever i almost got the crap kicked out of me i you know i saw a stage dive for my first time you know I, I, people were jumping on the stage was, someone, someone was messing with you at your first show oh yeah first <laughs> what, show. What show what, I what don't show even was know it? who it is i even know who it was john watson it <laughs> calling was, him um, out the, you motherfucker yeah, I, call, <laughs> no, I, lo- I love him he was he wasn't calling me out you know what he was doing my friend he was training me <laughs> he was training me in mosh pit ethics. Okay. That I, that I realized. Well, what happened was I was like, I didn't even know people slam danced because I never went to a show and there was no media. I had no older brother. There was just one kid in the scene who was a little older than us. So he just made up things and he's like, no one slam dances anymore. And n- none of us went to shows. <laughs> he's like, that's, slam. that's from the seventies. No one does that. So I went with a, a girlfriend of mine to CBGB's the night before like, I didn't even know there was hardcore. 
I thought it was all like after the Sex Pistols, it's just crazy stuff and it's all open, wide open. So anything from the band, you know, ABC, do you remember ABC? The look mm-hmm. of love. From ABC to Haircut 100 to the Bow Wow Wow to um, Adam and the Ants to the Sex Pistols to Cockney Rejects to UK Subs, it's all uh, to Black Flag. It's all to me in my sitting in my nest in Connecticut, it was all weird stuff. It wasn't ACDC. It wasn't Rush. It wasn't Jay Giles band. It was weird stuff. And so um, I just would go to New York City and I had older brothers that lived in New York City and my parents were from New York City. So I just go to New York City and hang out. My parents were completely cool with it. I was like 14. And they'd be like, yeah, have fun. Stay with, my, stay with your older brother. But they had no idea that, you know, New York City in the 80s was, it was like, it was a place where you could, um, you could get away with murder, literally mm-hmm. get away with murder. And the cops <laughs> couldn't care less. There's a whole Serpico, the movie written about it. Everybody was corrupt. And it was, a, it was such an element of danger. And then to go to a club. I don't know if mm-hmm. you remember your first going into a hardcore club. It was so fearful because there's always a bunch of kooks hanging out outside mm-hmm. and you're coming in from suburbia and you're like oh god how do i get through all these people it's so scary and you just do it and so the first show i went i went the night before i went to the ritz which is now webster hall i think it's still webster hall um but i went to see haircut 100 i don't know if you know who the haircut you might want to youtube search them but they are the most <laughs> like preppy poshy dancey Love, love, love plus one, yeah. But it was it was cutting edge. <laughs> it was cutting edge in a in a, in a rock and roll world. I think I think my first um, punk show that I went to, I went with my older brother, and we went and we saw we saw the Attics at the Pound in San Francisco. Good for you. Yeah. Good for you. You saw the Attics. <laughs> I saw a slightly wimpier version called Haircut One Hundred. <laughs> but. The next day, so we just, you know, laid out the Village Voice. That was the newspaper of the New York Lower East Side, especially you find what was playing. And some of the clubs you you didn't know about because they were never advertised unless you were on the inside circuit. So that weekend I went to the UK subs the next day and the Young and the Useless. Which Dude, was, the UK subs was my first show at Gilman, I think, which is crazy what? to think that our some of our yeah. first shows back line up. Then, and back then, they were cons- they were, I was like, these guys are so old. They're 30, <laughs> they're 35. <laughs> who, who the hell would do this at 35 years old? What losers? <laughs> it was going through my head. God knows what kids think of me. <laughs> they must be like, it's this retarded, this guy is an old man. He's still doing this. Dude, when I saw the UK subs, they must have been fucking... 60 or 70. It was sick. You know what? Yeah. The, Warhead, brother. Warhead. Yeah. Well, I didn't even know who they were. I just said, no, the name sounded punk and the young and the useless. That's how green I was. I didn't know mm-hmm. anything. I didn't know anything. Um, I went to Haircut 100 the day before. Need I say any more? So, <laughs> so anyway, I went to the UK subs and I'm sitting at a table with a girl with a drink that I thought you're supposed to buy a drink. You know, I wasn't straight edge. I didn't even know what straight edge was. And I was just like, thought I, I, I want to be grown up. I'm 15, I think. And they let you um, buy a drink? <laughs> I, in New York, it was New York. They let anybody in. Anybody can buy drinks. You can get your little sister in. So anyway, we're sitting there watching. I'm dressed really punk. I got a long devil, devil lock. Bill had long, one of those. <laughs> tren- long trench coat. Long trench coat. And then all of a sudden, when the, UK, the Young and the Useless started playing, Everyone started moshing. I was like, oh my God, they're moshing. I didn't even know. The word mosh wasn't public. No, n- n- the word mosh was exclusively for New Yorkers and you had to be on the inside. So to me, I was like, they're slam dancing. But in New York, there's a way to slam dance. This 80s slam dance, it was a very, very exclusive style you needed to be trained in. So that was my day of getting <laughs> trained. So I just went right for the slam, which was like running banging, knocking people over, people of clout, people that can cause danger upon me. (laughs) And then sure enough, a hand grabs me by the neck and he cocks his, in a hand of punch rings, cocks (laughs) cocks his fist back to punch me and my lights out. And I just looked at him, I go, I think I was literally like in 10th grade or ninth or 10th grade. I looked at him and I go, 
I'm sorry. I'm new to this. I don't know what to do. <laughs> Tell me. And then he just like threw me to the side. Like, okay, this guy's innocent. And yeah. then, I thought, then I learned, I was trained. This is how you did. And I realized, oh, I get it. There's a whole conformity thing. I thought I was a nonconformist. Mm-hmm. This ain't not, this is conformity. There's a way to dance. There's a way to dress. There's a way to act. There's yeah, you a, don't know uh, the steps to the line dance, man. There's a, there's a philosophy going on here. I got I to gotta hop to it. Then I learned how to mosh. Yeah, you know, I... Uh, well, well, I got to ask, when you learned to mosh, was it like an 80s training montage where like you're moshing on the beach with an Apollo Creed type <laughs> and then like uh, you're chasing like a chicken around sort of thing or was it just uh, you picked it up What do I do osmosis? in an interview when some guy's knocking on my door? Some guy's knocking on my door. Go no answer. You- Bring him on the pod. Yeah, well, so, you can answer. Go get it. Okay, hold on. Yeah. Talk to each other. Say something. <laughs> not a chance. I'm not going to talk to this what guy. If, what if it's like an Amazon guy will bring him on and be <laughs> like... <laughs> Uh, hey, what, what are you bringing, Ray? It's like I got some USB cables. <laughs> <laughs> we should do an unboxing when he gets back. <laughs> yeah, come back with a bloody nose. It's the guy that he uh, he was talking about earlier. It's like I heard you say, uh, I heard you talk shit on this podcast. That's not even out yet. Um, He's got his uh, phone hacked or something like that. He's got in- insight into uh, what he says. I'm pretty sure Ray lives pretty far out there. He lives like in the wilderness, I think. I got to ask him about that. Oh, really? Yeah, I saw a video. I'll ask him. I saw a video of him. Woo! Sorry about that. We What'd you get? Homeschool. Nothing. We homeschool, so kids are looking for their parents. Um, um, I mean, we have groups, groups of homeschoolers hanging out at the house. Uh, I got to ask you about that because I saw a really interesting... It's really heartwarming video of you uh, with your kid and your kid's about to jump in what looks like a pond or something to catch a rake. It's a, by the way, it's a freezing cold <laughs> pond. It looks so, like a beautiful summer day or where, something. It's freezing. Where do you live at? Because you looked like you were straight up in nature. It was very beautiful. Yeah, it's our backyard. We, you know, I'm in the public eye a lot still, so I try to move as far away from humans as possible. As much Good. As possible. So that we can yeah. zoom into your house and ask you questions <laughs> about your first time slam dancing. <laughs> I, I can't remember if I finished my story, but that was my first um, re-entry into the, the world of, oh, there's this thing. And then what you discovered back in that scene was, oh, wait, there are bands. There's a record label. There was a record label called Rat Cage Records. And the only records out, the only records in New York that were out that time, the Heart Attack single, the Kraut first single, maybe the maybe their second single too, which is a great single. I don't know if you heard that. Unemployed. Are you into Kraut ever? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Okay. Um, the False Prophets, The Misguided, and then all of a sudden it started happening. The Abused, Urban Waste, Reagan Youth, all these bands that you'd watch, you'd love, but they didn't have a record out. It was a weird time because... The only bands that had records out were these big bands, the Adolescents or the Dead Kennedys. There was no New York City bands that really had records out. Kraut made the first stand and just impressed everybody. But then all the hardcore stuff started to evolve. It was, it was a really exciting time to be around. Did you? Because everything was limited. It was hard to find. And the clubs were unique. And you had to search them out and find, find out how to get in, how to get there. And you're with a bunch of other people that either have been doing it for a while and get it, or people like you are just sort of feeling their way around in the dark. Did you ever uh, see or play with Urban Waste? When I was growing up, that was a huge band for me. I had a homemade Urban Waste t-shirt and shit. Um, my first show in Violent Children was with, check out this bill. Um, Agnostic Front, Cause for Alarm, Urban Waste, The Vatican Commandos, which was Moby's band, and um, Reagan Youth. Nice. And... Right after our set, the cops raided the place. This was in Connecticut and Bridgeport. Raided the place, and all the young kids hid under the sta- uh, under the stage. So where was not, where was the show? It was a place called Pogos. Okay. In Bridgeport, it was like there. It was great. We played played with Flipper there, Circle Jerks. Saw the Circle Jerks there. I mean, Circle Jerks and Wild in the Streets tour. It was like incredible. So why did the cops raid the place? Underage. You know, yeah. it was all eight. It was that story eight. of you, fifteen years old, drinking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. Uh, it was. Um, um, yeah, at that point, I think I was into straight edge. But um, it was when they served alcohol in the place, and you had kids. Kids weren't allowed where they served alcohol. Mm-hmm. 
but it was exciting. I mean, it was like a Saturday afternoon and you come back with your father's car and, and you, you had this experience that you try to tell. You can't even tell people what happened that crazy weekend you came home and you hid under the stage, your band played on stage, all these crazy people from New York showed up, started moshing and there was a crazy fight broke out. Like it's like right out of a saloon in the wild west. It was such an interesting, crazy comic book life, life to be part of. You know, um, Purcell and Gavin from uh, Burn and um, Craig Satari, all, I think Gavin's been visiting up here, but Purcell lives up here and so does uh, Craig. And they called me out to go meet them for lunch, but I was busy that day. And Craig was telling me like they had a friend of theirs who they don't, who knew, knew nothing about hardcore. Mm -hmm. And they just, those three, when they get together, Gavin, Purcell, I mean, these, Craig, these guys are like the best storytellers. They're like the brothers Grimm of hardcore. When they get them <laughs> together, they just started telling hardcore stories. And the guy was listening and he and finally winds up going, you guys have left, led such an incredible life. I've done nothing. I've done nothing with my life. You know, I've noticed that a lot when hardcore guys get together and they start telling stories. You'll see a lot of people, they go, I've never been in a fight in my whole life, you know. So, I, I know, like, I know. 45. I, I'm always <laughs> running into people that have never been. I was like, you've never been into fights? They're like, have you? I was like, millions. I, I stopped telling people because I realized that it's not normal. You know what I mean? To just, I was like, oh, yeah, when I was young, yeah, I don't know, 15, 20 fights. And people are like, what? What are you talking about? Because And I realized, oh, shit, I'm in an office place now. And these, they didn't have They've fights They've never done anything. Up. Yeah, I think so. It's a, Per, tr between you and I, I guess, and the podcast audience, I think it teaches you something when you fight. I think kids are very, very pampered nowadays, and they don't know. A pr all they know is like shouting shit on the internet. Mm -hmm. My older brother fights, told me fights kind of teach you that you're like not that that you're you're not invincible in a way. Like that, it, it lets you kind of figure out your your boundaries or what you're capable of. And it's just like, oh, I got punched in the face. I survived. Now I don't have to fear being punched in the face uh, because I know that what the worst case scenario is here. You know, and so it just, you know, yeah, it, it, it it kept me alive. I think because you learn some street smarts, like mm -hmm. what not to do, what to do. What it, it gave you street smarts in in when you're dealing with part of the world that's uncivilized. There's parts of a community that are just not civilized. They're not going to play by your good rules, mm -hmm. you know, and you just learn how to behave in a way that like self-preservance, self, yeah. what's the word? Preservation. Preservation. There's, there's definitely some people, you can see some videos online of 45 year old dudes who have clearly never been in a fight and they just do these bizarre things where they walk right up to dudes who it's like, that guy will fuck you up. And they say, excuse me, sir, are you leaning on my car or whatever? It's like, whoa, you have no idea what you're getting yourself into. Right, um, right, right. My older brother told me, he was like, one of the things you learn when you get in a fight is that you're not made out of glass. And I think that, that that actually is a lesson you can learn uh, when you're young is like, look, I got punched. Maybe I fell over. Maybe I didn't fall over, but I'm still here, you know, and you don't have to be afraid. My father gave me, my father was sort of like an intellectual bookworm type. And then I, I was getting picked on after school, mm -hmm. like regularly when I was like, fifth grade or something and i was asking like what do i do I'm get, i get really freaked out and scared and like a gang of kids would get around me just pick on me he said you know that happened to me too he, my father grew up in uh, jamaica queens and he goes you know that used to happen to me too it was really tough i said well what did you do he goes i bought brass knuckles and i just <laughs> beat one kid within the hair of his life and I was like, this is the last thing my father would ever, <laughs> I'd ever expect to come out of my father's mouth. And he goes, and after that, they just stopped messing with me. Yeah. <laughs> That's crazy. Like, and today I, I'm going to pass these brass knuckles <laughs> on to you, son. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, father. <laughs> That's one of the few pieces of advice I remember from my last My, my dad always said, if we came home and we had any scratches on us, you're like, did you guys get in a fight? He said, yeah. And he said, did you win? We would usually say, yeah. And then he goes, all right, good. And you walk away. <laughs> yeah, don't tell your mother. He also would say, you would say, uh, make sure you hit the biggest guy first. He always told us that. That's good advice. <laughs> uh, uh, Ray, tell me about your kids and um, their schooling. Because when I was watching that video of one of your kids jumping into this pond and it looked like this outdoorsy sort of nature thing, I just thought about like, 
I don't really have that many memories like that where I'm like jumping into this. It looks very wild. It looked very natural. My kids grow up wild. They rarely yeah. wear shoes. My 15 year old daughter, I'll take her downtown. I was like, where are your shoes? You're not wearing shoes. Who needs shoes? You know, they grew up outside, <laughs> which is sort of how I wanted to have kids. Mm-hmm. The first part of their life, they went to a Waldorf school, which is, you know, a 400 acre Steiner school on, um, you know, a bio. I don't know what those are. Oh, it's, it, he was a guy that created a pedagogy for uh, kids that's connected with nature and spirit. Mm. Um, he's from German. He was influenced heavily by the East. He predicted the bee collapse, uh, um, uh, 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 honey bee collapse. He, pred- he, he, he called the, in, uh, like in the forties or something, he was calling the um, school that we've created a pressure cooker system. Mm. where kids get so much pressure from their childhood, they forget how to think and they just mm-hmm. ha- know how to do. And um, they get rewarded and punished for, not- for doing. He talked about different types of intelligences. And he said the best way for kids to learn is to play mm-hmm. and spend their- all their time, spend a lot of their time in play and imagination, which means you have to t- take away the media from them because it ruins your imagination. And a lot of their imagination starts with storytelling. And storytelling it doesn't even have to be from a book. It has to be with, without pictures. It comes from me telling a story, and then they have to create all that stuff in their mind. Mm. So when you see a movie, there it is. You know, Darth Vader's wearing this. The stormtrooper wears that. He represents good. He represents evil. But it takes their imagina- imagination away. So a lot of things is very simple toys, all made of wood, all, na- all natural ingredients, most of the time is spent outside, doesn't matter what the weather is. And then not so long ago, I, I pulled them out of there because uh, we don't vaccinate our children. Mm. And that's a whole thing. If, if you say you don't vaccinate, everybody thinks you're a Trump follower. But um, we just uh, believe that the body's got what it takes to heal itself. And we've been going on that for a while. And, cool. Um, when did you get into that? Is that a, uh, is that a know, part of any sort of like, other philosophy or is it just it, it's something you ran a, into? It, it's something when I've been to natural living and natural diet, Dr. Mercola and all these the original like sort of inspirational health inspired people. Since I was a teenager, I was into healthy living and healthy diet. And so, yeah, why inject these things? And it's, can I trust big pharma? It's like, first of all, I can't even get a straight answer because mm-hmm. it's so much dominated by um, uh, big pharma who's going to give their information on it. It's hard to find what's actually true. Mm-hmm. You'll get people biased on both, or, both, both sides, and it's hard to find some truth. Um, I do know three people who I'm close to that told me straight up when their kids got um, uh, uh, vaccinated, they immediately became autistic. Mm. Three people in my life that that's actually happened to. I mean uh, – Modern doctors will say, no, this is just completely concocted. It's made up. But like I said, I have three people, parents who swear by it. So anyway, I've been avoiding it. God knows it's going to get mandated one of these days. They mandated everybody in New York State. I know my good friend from this school, I'm wearing Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu school. Yeah. He said that he, when he was a child, when they vaccinated him, he started getting seizures. Mm. I know another friend who said his daughter got seizures first time they vaccinated her. So do you avoid all of them, including like the really I old personally school ones? Had them. Like I personally had them. Typhoid, like the yeah, ones that are like... I, I, I personally had all of them yeah. from a childhood, uh, but my kids never have. They've been to India like seven times. Mm. Um, Dude, I had the opposite. They never, they, my kids <laughs> never get sick. Kids I had the opposite upbringing. When I was a kid, my mom would bring me to the doctors. Um, she had breast cancer America. and she, would, she, she was very worried about whether or not we were going to live and die and all these sorts of stuff. And she would say... We're going to China. Like, give them. Is there anything else you can give them? <laughs> you got any experimental <laughs> shit that you just got lying around? <laughs> <laughs> we haven't tried out yet. <laughs> so, I turned out. Hey, I mean, up you to still up for debate how I turned out, but it worked for me. I think You're pretty good. <laughs> I, I will say that um, I'm not anti Western medicine at all. Uh-huh. My, my, I have, I have type. My, I have a son with type one diabetes, which means mm-hmm. he's insulin dependent. Which means if there was no insulin, no pump, no, et cetera, that goes with diabetes, no blood, checking your blood. 
he'd be dead. He'd be blind and dead. So I'm not, and that, it was, it was a good lesson in, okay, listen, there's benefits in both things here. Um, but you know, anyway, sure. That's well, it. You that, know was what? A diver- that was a diversion from the kids went to that school. It was a good school, but when they started mandating, um, uh, vaccines, we went to another outdoor education homeschooling group, which was, it's like a forest school for from mm-hmm. nine o'clock to three o'clock. You're outdoors all day. Doesn't matter what the weather is. You learn fire by friction, building forts in the woods. It sounds like a blast. Foraging. Yeah. It's one of those things where I'm almost feeling guilty for like, okay, get outside. Bye. Cause it's like pouring rain out. But you know, what's interesting. You develop, <laughs> especially as kids, you just develop a tolerance for it. Mm-hmm. They're not wimpy whatsoever. They'll, they're literally spend the whole day outside. Then they come home. And they're playing like in 50 degree weather soccer on the front lawn barefoot in, well, in, in drizzle. And it's, <laughs> it's like their constitution becomes incredibly strong, like that of a farmer or something. Well, it's interesting because like the, uh, so you shared that video, which is, it's like a funny thing where you're just like sharing a slice of your life. And I was, I saw one of your kids jumping into this pond. It was like a dirty looking pond. And I was like, you know, I don't think I do very many things like that. And my friends don't think things like that, but it looks like it's like living. It's like, there's like a certain... There's life in this Real video. Life. First of all, it's, of, first of all, it's like bentonite clay and spring water. So mm-hmm. even all that's in there is pine needles, which you can eat pine needles. Mm-hmm. But I, I've drank that water. It's coming right from the earth. <laughs> it's like probably it's better. I'd safely say um, it's better than taking a shower in New York City than to spring and to, to, to bathe in upstate New York spring water. Come on. So you know that's some views. Your, your, whatever you're putting on your skin, you're eating. Right. So to take in spring water, that's basically ripe water, water that's being forced out of the earth. It's like the best thing. It's like a superfood in itself. This actually goes into something else I wanted to talk to you about, which is like, um, I feel like some of the, my favorite bands of all time have some sort of extremist views to them, or they (laughs) don't play hardcore just because they're playing hardcore. They play it like to please God. Almost, you know, you have you to today, Cro-Mags, Bad Brains, or some sort of higher power or spirituality or something. Yeah. Um, and hey, so is it probably is the origin of music in itself as an offering to some sun god, higher power, even like Vedic music chants to demigods or God or things like that. Probably the origins of music are inter- probably very much interwoven. I've never studied this. Interwoven with glorifying deities of nature Mm -hmm. so go on sorry but but pretty much my point is it's uh when i hear you like like ray capos out in the woods not vaccinating i'm like that's a extremist sort of stance from modern mainstream society right it's also what makes all of your art so interesting and cool to me and why i'm so happy that you're here is because you are you, you you do you think of things in a different way where like straight edge was different you know, Krishna core was different and all these, you know, sure. I love the art that comes out of those extremists. Like you were saying earlier, like it's freak stuff. I love freak the stuff. art that comes out of that. <laughs> it's freak, it's, freak, it's freak, freak them. Welcome to freak them. Well, I'm glad you guys like me. I was, I was like hard times, the podcast or these guys, these guys are going to either like me or hate my guts and just try to crush me. I was like, but I'm going to just do it. <laughs> Well, so I had a question going back to, so I had, with uh, Krishna, I had heard that initially the the way that kind of made it into the scene was because that's where shows were able to happen. Like you were able to play in Krishna spaces and it, is, is this no. true? Okay. No, no. Um, it, it, you want the, you want the genesis of it? Yeah. Yeah. Just the like genesis uh, of it? The, gen- the genesis of it is part of any Hindu Dharma is the distribution, I don't know if I said this on Joe Rogan or not, but part of the genesis of Hindu Dharma is to give food that's been prepared with love to God and to distribute that freely. So if you go to any holy city in India, you will always be fed. They'll always invite you to temples, give you sacred food, like a meal. Sometimes you walk by and there'll be a guy in the street just passing it out. It's just part of the Dharma of Hindus is to give out that because they say it contains an ingredient which is not found in just regular nutrition. It's the energy of love placed within the food by the cook. So the idea is 
the consciousness of the cook affects the, the food that you eat. And when it's done in a divine way, it affects people in a divine. It has nothing to do with feeding the homeless. It's got to do with everybody is destitute because they're, they're disconnected. And so that was part of the mission of the Krishna movement that came to America is to distribute prashad to anybody who wants prashad. Prashad is called sacred food. And so they would set up anywhere, but also in Tompkins Square Park, which where everybody hung out. So I think the Cromags and these guys, uh, Rody for the Bad Brains, this guy Tom Tomas, they started eating this food, but also reading the Gita because they'd have these Bhagavad Gitas. And the Gita is like one of these classic ancient books of knowledge that people of, you know, everybody from Thoreau and Emerson and Oppenheimer, uh, you know, read these books and studied these books because they felt like, then this is like interesting wisdom literature. And so anyway, I think that's what happened is they started uh, getting interested in the philosophy and they all became vegetarians. The Cro-Mags guys were all vegetarians. And then Harley from the Cro-Mags used to preach to me all the time. cro show is where I first had Prashad or that sanctified food. And then it was just another weird thing, part of the community, but in a very, like before the scene was even that big. And for me, I was like, uh, I'm sketchy, but whatever these hardcore people, I wanted my spirituality to be completely separate from hardcore. And so if it's into hardcore, it can't be like real, you know? So that was the inroads. Probably by the time shelter came around, we did shows at we maybe about six temples. And generally we've actually played at one was in DC, once in New York, one in Houston, one in Dallas, one at the Rathiatra festival in New York city. And one at the Rathiatra festival in, LA and then some peculiar farm we played at in uh, Louisiana or Mississippi or something like that. What was that like? Yeah. Did they know what they were? They said, no, it was a Krishna farm. It was a Krishna farm, but we were just traveling through and said, can we stay here? And they said, yeah, we're having a festival. You want to play? But it was just like (laughs) the only people were there were a bunch of like little Krishna kids, like eight years old, 10 years old. And a matter of fact, shelter made a tour video um, and it's funny because they have on the tour video, it's just a bunch of edited clips of our tour. And one, we're playing a song and then the camera zooms to the audience and it's a bunch of children just dancing. <laughs> that, that is from that one peculiar show. And there's that oh, one God, guy from that New up. York that is ready to punch a kid in the face. And like, wait, well, hold <laughs> no, on, no. That, that didn't happen. There was none of that. It was just us on a Krishna farm with no, everyone's just basically a... It sounded, from hardcore. It sounded like earlier you mentioned uh, taking away the media um, and then you're talking about moving further out, uh, being in touch with nature, spirituality. I want to know, is there any like guilty play? Like, do you absolutely love dancing with the stars or something? Because you keep <laughs> going further and further into Too these extreme. subcultures, you know subcultures. Is there something in, from mainstream something culture that you just love? Stri- you know, it's... Let's see. I like mixed martial arts, but it, that wasn't mainstream. Yeah, it wasn't. You know what I mean? It wasn't. Now it's very mainstream. You know, when they first tried to start the UFC, the, the guy who was starting it, his idea was to have the cage electrified. That was like, that. I've never heard that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're not getting out of this. Yeah. Bring it um, back. Let's, let's turn that. Let's, let's juice it. Yeah. Um, uh, what do I like? That's mainstream. I don't watch so much TV. Mm hmm. And uh, I don't listen to that much music outside of, you know, Indian. You got Netflix? Is there like a, is there like some show you you binge? I've got some theft one. Theft, (laughs) borrowing someone's password. Um, But my kids watch a movie occasionally, but I I don't really watch. Uh, Truthfully, at night, I tried, I I tried um, to watch something with my wife. We both, I just fall asleep. I'm one of these guys. I'm very hyper all day. Once you sit me down, I'm out. I'm a lousy date. My poor wife. It's like, as soon as I get to a movie, I'm out asleep. I just sleep. I go to sleep really early. I wake up very early. Okay. I want to take advantage of the fact that you're here and ask you this, uh, this question I've been thinking about a little bit because you're a guy with a lot of knowledge. Um, a lot of something. I've often, I've often thought about, uh, you know, I'm going to, business person, right? Bill and I started a business together. We've done a bunch of things. And I've often often thought about each little step creates a a positive effect towards your next step where you're like snowballing in a positive manner. Sure. It's like, it's not about ever getting that one big deal. It's every day you lay another brick and then eventually you've built this house. And 
with COVID and all the stuff that's going on, I feel like I'm forced to take a bunch of, to do all these negative patterns now. It's like reinforcing all these negative things in my life where it's like, I'm not leaving the house. I'm not eating that well. I'm just kind of trapped a little bit. Sure. So my question to you is thinking about when you, sometimes you have a positive snowball going and sometimes you have a negative snowball. When you have that negative snowball, how do you break out of that negative snowball? How do you say, you know what, enough's enough. I'm going to redirect right. and start taking question. steps in a positive question. direction. Um, first of all, it's the fact that you're even aware of it is huge because some people are just unaware of They're just getting carried by the ups and downs of the material world. So the fact that you're aware of it is big. The, the fact that at a young age, you probably set some standards of what is okay and what is not okay. And suppose you were straight edge and all of a sudden COVID hits and you start drinking again. That happened to a lot of people. Um, then at least you're, you, you've dipped into a thing that this isn't me. So sometimes it depends on where you're at. Um, I felt like I was getting to a point last week. We have these things on my podcast. I do a podcast. And we have these Wisdom of the Sages. Me- Yes, it is. Muslim yeah. Sages. It's a it's a spiritual podcast. I mean, a, a, a cool community of people, um, and uh, we have this thing called Makeover Mondays, where wherever you did last week, we we say that life is either for upgrading or degrading. Your choices, your food, your your friendships, your conversation, your your recreation. It either upgrades your life or it degrades it. Um, and so we say, make those choices each Monday. How do I want to upgrade in my life? What do I want to let go of? And if you did last week bad, that's gone. Don't worry about it. If you did last week great, good, build on it. And so write, write down an actual list of things you need to upgrade and then take it one day at a time for a week and see how it goes. So it, it, it goes by noticing it and then, okay, it's Monday. I got to do this again. Mm-hmm. Some people do that with a New Year's resolution, but once they give up on January 12th, they have to wait till the next year. So we just say every Monday, you just check in with who you want to become. Hmm, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Another thing that I've been thinking about is, I don't know if you've ever thought about this. Sometimes, you, you probably have. Sometimes <laughs> I feel like uh, I'm on complete autopilot. Like I don't even think about what I'm going to say before I say it or what I'm going to do before I do it. I'm just kind of like a leaf floating down a river and that's it. Shit. Like I'm not that actually in that much of control of who I am. It's like, I don't know what you decides who I am. A, a podcast or in general? <laughs> Always. Like okay. the decision to have the pot, the decision to create the podcast, the decision to create hard times. Sure. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm just set down this path. I'm wondering if I know that you're a guy who reads all sorts of, you know, ancient wisdom and all sorts of stuff. <laughs> Is there any way when you feel like you're going down this path, if you feel like it's not a good path, can you redirect? And if so, how? And these are well, personal questions. I'm just taking advantage of the fact no, that you're on my podcast. No, it, you know, it's okay. It's, well, it's, they're, also, cool, they're cool questions. So, I'm mean, curious. Is, um, is there a destiny? Is, is there a destiny to your life already predetermined? Is that one of your part of the question? Yeah, kind of like, do I actually have all that much free will? Or am I, sometimes people, uh, yeah. for example, with yeah. hard times, sometimes people say. Slave like, to your destiny. People say, like, man, you did such a great job with that. That's crazy. And I go, you're like, did yeah, I? I don't really know. I almost feel like I had no part of it. You know what? It just kind of happened. I can share with you some pretty interesting stuff. You know, people can take, take it for what they want. We have very little free will, but we do have free will. Hmm. Um, It might be your karma to get punched in the face. How you react to that karma. That's your free will. Hmm. Here's another way to explain it. We're all on a plane flying to Hawaii. That's our karma. We can't get out for the most part. We can't get out. What you do on that plane, that's your free will. You can read on the plane. You get drunk on the plane. You can flirt with the stewardess on the plane. Whatever you want. We do so many different things on that plane. That's your free will, and it's creating future karma. Mm. So we do have some free. Now, the, the yoga system is seeing where you're at. The true yoga, yoga is so popular now, everybody does yoga, but the true yoga system is to really raise the consciousness to this energy called sattva, which is mean, I can give you an example as far as things we can relate to, like addiction. Mm -hmm. Addiction is in a lower grade, it's called tamas. Tamas means 
you're lazy, you're lethargic, you're in, you're intoxicated, you're 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 um, self-absorbed, you're rude, you're angry, you're violent. That is called tamas. And when you act in that way, you have very little free will. For example, if I'm addicted to something, even mm-hmm. something harmful like heroin, and you say, "Hey, Raghunath, would you like some uh, uh, Ray? I'm sorry, Ray, would you like some uh, organic? Uh, would you like an organic salad I made for you?" The person who's addicted to heroin is going to be like, "No, I don't." freaking organic salad. I want heroin. So you're offering me something that's very good for me, but the addiction, that energy that I'm in right now has taken away my choices. Mm-hmm. It's going to make me choose something that's killing me, ruining my family, lo- making me lose my career, right? So the, the practice of yoga culture, which is not just a physical practice, it's meditation, it's breathing, it's a lifestyle. It brings us to a point where we have um, we can think about things a little deeper. Our mind is controlled. Just like when a yoga, when a guy's practicing yoga poses and the teacher's saying, breathe. Why do we breathe? Well, if you've ever worked out, you're panting, you're in your mind. But if you actually start practicing deep breathing while you're doing something very tough, you actually become calm in a tough place. Mm. It's a great practice for life when you know your kids can drive you crazy or your spouse can drive you crazy or the traffic can drive you crazy how can i just not be that affected and be so reactive so this breathing technique is also part of the yoga process and then what happens is no matter what the world is throwing at you you just become calm and the next thing you know you've changed the way you react to things so what's happening in the yoga process it it gives you you still have some karma but it gives you options. Now, if I'm in that state of mind, as opposed to addicted to heroin, and you say, hey, hey, um, Ray, you want an organic salad? I say, sure. You want some heroin? No, I don't want heroin. Because I can think it through. I I thought what heroin does. I'm Mm -hmm. not interested. Are you sure it's free? It's good stuff. Not interested. (laughs) You know what I mean? That's a great heroin hookup you got there. (laughs) Yeah, a lot of good heroin. Free, good heroin? Hmm. (laughs) I've never done it. I don't even know what's good and bad. Thank God. But anyway, so yeah, we have some destiny. And if you study Jyotish, which is uh, Vedic or Indian astrology, it's really amazing. Like I did mine in 1991. Mm -hmm. It's like reading my autobiography. My girlfriend is huge into <laughs> astrology. Uh, what's the difference between the astrology people use nowadays when they type it into an app and Indian astrology? Indian astrology can also be done through computers. Mm-hmm. Um, there's two parts. It's more like, truthfully, studying of astrology, I can't speak for Western. It's lunar, but it's based on the moon. Mm-hmm. And you can track major parts of your life in different periods. And... Um, probably similar in a lot of ways but then you have to be able to interpret it well and that that's what makes a great astrologer and hopefully the people that you're giving it to you're assisting them and not just making them depressed or angry or something like that there might be very very obvious signs that say there's going to be massive loss in your life this year ray and um a good astrologer would say this is a great time to get internal is a great internal period of your life, you know, instead mm. of saying you're going to lose everything that you love. You know? <laughs> yeah. Watch out motherfucker. <laughs> but I will say I've been to many astrologers and it's uncanny the stuff they know. I want to ask you something. I feel like I probably am misinterpreting this and I have a kind of a negative mindset on it, but I want to ask you about it. Okay. We're talking about karma a little bit. You're talking about uh, we're on a plane to Hawaii and like, we don't really, seems like we don't really choose that destination. Maybe we can decide which seat we, we sit in. Um, did I do something to get sent to Hawaii? And if someone's on a plane to a very, very dark place, is there some sort of thought process about why their karma is sending them to that dark place? And if there is, have you ever thought about how that's a little, you could almost like look down on people who are doing really poorly in their life because it's like, it's like their karma is sending them down this bad road. Our, our job is good. That's a great question. It's a common question too, because what we're seeing is, you know, um, for example, Matt, we see you in this life right now. You got a beard and you're a successful businessman and podcast. Well, it's not going nuts. So I don't come <laughs> that too much here. Right? He's, but, he's passable as these things. <laughs> But this is, um, in, the, in the biggest picture of your spirit identity, this is just one thin page of, of the many identities you've had. And who knows what you did in your previous life and what you did in the, 
who knows what you've done in lifetimes past and who knows even what you've done, you know, five years ago or 10 years ago. I mean, I've done a lot of crazy things before I even realized like, Oh, you shouldn't torture animals. That's not a good thing. You know, like I did when I was a, a fisherman, you know, you shouldn't do that. That's, that's a bad thing. So I've done horrible, cruel things in this lifetime. What to speak of lifetimes. I can't even remember. And everything evens out. Now, that might sound um, callous when there's pain, mm -hmm. but for us, it's our job not to be callous. Our job is to be sensitive for when people are in pain and be empathetic and compassionate to them. Our job isn't to say, ah, it deserves your right, it's just your karma. Mm. But imagine if whenever there was some pain in your life, some heartache in your life or some loss in your life, you say, you know what? I might deserve much more than that. Mm. What, I mean, if, is it a better option to blame your circumstance or to blame others for your pain? Because any good therapist will say, you're not going to heal from that. Any good therapist who's worth their degree is going to say, you know what? What's your responsibility in this? How can this be avoided in the future? A good, a good therapist is going to take you to a place of trauma and, and show how that affected your choices to get you in this problematic situation very often why you chose that alcoholic spouse why you keep letting abusive people in your life they're going to take you and make you accountable any good mm -hmm. western therapist and the problem in the east they'll just take it back again they'll say oh you I, you know in the, in the west they'll say well you had an abusive father um that's why you're making all these bad choices towards men or something like that in the east they'll say yeah you're making these bad choices towards men but that bad father, you also chose him because mm. you've been making these bad choices for lifetimes, not mm. just in this lifetime. So it's almost like a radical responsibility for, I got what I got. Now, what am I going to deal with it? Well, how am I going to deal with it? And so as, as a yoga teacher though, when someone is in one of those bad situations, you guys don't just like pass up on those people, right? Like, ah, your karma's and, totally no, fucked. Just the opposite. Just the opposite. Just the opposite. You're extra compassionate. You're em mm -hmm. extra empathetic. You're extra um, caring and you're, and you're extra loving. That's just part of, that's part of living that life of a yogi. You don't just write them off as it's your karma. Our job is to be compassionate and understanding uh, but when we have some pain happen to us, we just think, this is my karma. I probably deserve much worse. And um, uh, how am I going to, now what am I going to do with it? Mm. Right? I mean, think about it. Our suffering very often comes from blame. Our, we blame others for our pain. It's a very common thing. And we live in that blame. And you will never be healed from that. If you're blaming an ex for your misfortune, you're going to suffer until you forgive that ex. That's just part of life. That's not like the Hare Krishna movement talking. That's any good therapist is going to take you to tell, take you to take some responsibility for having got what you got. Mm. What, I, what I've really learned from this, especially through Matt's line of questioning, is that I have to check up on him more and check in and see how he's doing because clearly he's been thinking <laughs> a lot about these uh, these issues. So Matt, when the podcast is done recording, I'm, I'm good for another couple well, of okay, hours so he, to talk so about he, some things. So here's the thing. Uh, you know, I've been to some Youth of Today shows. Like I, I saw you guys in Oakland uh, a while back and actually I interviewed Porcel and there's been times where Ray's said stuff on stage where I go, hmm. really it like changed my perspective on something like, a, you know, train your brain to see each other as one family, that sort of stuff. I go, hmm, All right. yeah, that, that, makes, that makes sense. You know what I mean? Like you should look at your neighbors like a, a, a piece of your extended family. So if he's on my podcast, I'm going to ask him some questions. <laughs> All right. You, you go away. You keep going, man. Uh, yeah, it's because I, I think a lot about – a lot about some of these things because I see hardcore as like a place with a ton of philosophy in it, but you're one of the characters who really dug in and sought philosophy from around the world uh, that might be helpful. A lot of the hardcore philosophy is really interesting and fun, but it's also home to some like kind of, I like radical stuff, but hardcore and punk has also been home to some really bad ideas, some really detrimental <laughs> ideas. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I feel like Straight Edge um, and that whole scene 
because I am straight edge. I feel like there's a lot of really good philosophy in there. So I definitely connect with a lot of it. Also a lot of like the DIY stuff because I'm, I, I do a bunch of business things. So I'm, I'm, always, thinking, I'm always thinking about this stuff. Uh, another thing that I keep thinking about is because of the business that Bill and I am in, are you going to tell oh. me what business you got? Do you guys tell share what business you're in? Or is it oh, weed we business, are, brother? Yeah, no, it's uh, it's we're revenge, moving heavy weight. <laughs> revenge pornography is what uh, is what he's talking about. Uh, it's very vile stuff. We've got well, we've got this business, which is a, a publication, um, which we started uh, together five years ago, six years ago, six six years ago in November. We really started with eight hundred bucks. Por- it's not really a revenge pornography, is it? No, 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 no. no, no, no. Ray's hella worried. He's on some I gotta horrible go. market. Yeah. <laughs> so we started hard times like six years ago. We started with eight hundred bucks. Um, we recently sold most of it for a little over a million bucks, which was great. What? So yeah, hard times the podcast. No, the whole thing, the whole the whole brand. We have a, a new owner who's a great guy. Um, is a really interesting character. Um, we're part of a bigger family of sites now. And then I've got a couple other businesses. Um, I, I have a technology. $5? Can I borrow $5? <laughs> you bet. <laughs> I love when people talk big money and I ask right. them five bucks. Right. Here's what we're doing. I have a technology business too. And when that technology business takes off, you're going to come in and give classes to my employees. That's the path that we're on. This is the plane that we're on. Let's like uh, like all those Silicon Valley. You haven't seen the show, but Silicon Valley. Um, okay. One more question. No TV. I don't watch TV, sadly. Okay. Um, a lot of the businesses I'm involved with, like podcasting, uh, publications, Bill's involved with like stand-up comedy. Um, in order to be successful in these businesses, you have to do all these things where it's like you have to demand attention from people. You have to like create creative assets with your face on them and get as many impressions as you can on them. You have to be like a master of social media. And as you get better at these skills and your business increases, I feel like you do damage to your personality, right? Because it's this constant, like, here's a picture of me. Here's a picture of me. It's a cross between building a brand and a fast track to narcissism. Mm Mm-hmm. You so, can only take so many pictures of yourself before you're like, you're, you're sick to the stomach. You know what I mean? Um, it's a problem. I know. I need social media for my business, mm-hmm. but my business is, a, a, it's, it's based on my face or my body. And there's a problem with that. So you have to be able, you got to, you got to use, you, you got to go, you got to go in and out and you can't hang out that much. And also again, it's a slippery slope dealing with social media. You're not yeah. seeing reality. You're seeing the highlight reel of people's lives. You know, you're not seeing like, um, I, I, bin- I binged, I was binge eating last night, shit. Or I was, you know, uh, you know I, oh, I, I, I drank too much last night, shit. I vomited in my bed because I was out cold. I'm what do you call, I'm fighting with my spouse again. You know, no one's putting that on their stories. You're seeing the highlight reel, the little clip of them, their feet at the beach somewhere in the Bahamas. And then you look at that and you think, why aren't I in the freaking Bahamas? Why aren't I, at, you know, in some exotic land? Why aren't my kids happy? My kid just got arrested, whatever it is. And so it creates a type of deep depression. This, you know, this is problematic for culture. And I've heard, I've read recently in, in teenage girls, especially it creates real bodily uh yeah bill's had a big problem with that isn't that right bill (laughs) yeah well matt (laughs) likes to bring up the fact that uh i have uh too small of a mouth and my butt is too big (laughs) and my ears are tiny and he likes to point it out in every photo i've ever posted online uh so what I'm dealing with is a very abusive business partner here. That just Ray, kind of next question. Next question. How on. do I stop abusing my business partners via Instagram <laughs> comments? You're going to have to go to a 12-step meeting for that. <laughs> oh, Ray, did you uh, – Sammy told us this hilarious story on uh, – Sammy was on our podcast. And uh, Sammy, he told, I love Sammy. He told us a story about you putting him like in a – that you guys were on tour – and you were it was like, a hey, shelter man. tour, and there was a there was a yogi that came with you uh, on a and shelter like, tour, and he was in a separate van. And you were like, Sammy, you go sit with him. And Sammy's like, I don't want to sit with <laughs> Swami. him. Swami. <laughs> and then he got like all these life lessons. Eight hour drive indoctrinated. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about Sam, that. If you really want to know the, uh, if you really want to know the history of Krishna consciousness in the music scene from shelter on. Ask Sammy. He witnessed the whole thing go from zero to a hundred in a few years. 
<laughs> on the yeah. sidelines, just kind of a on little sideline, just witnessing, yeah. <laughs> just wit- yeah, Not like in a, just appreciating and witnessing it, you know? Did you ever have, like, was there any big... Uh, I mean, Sam and Purcell were in the original Shelter lineup before Purcell was even into Krishna. They just came, Purcell was in Judge. He had no interest in krishna or anything like that he just you know he's a friend sammy was just a friend and they just that was we don't know what to do next let's do this you know let's go on tour with ray was there ever any um tension between injecting so much philosophy and spirituality into some of these projects uh or were were your guys ready to go were they troopers um with shelter that was the game Mm -hmm. either you're into the game or you weren't Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Shelter started as my final record. That was, that was supposed to be my final record to the world. I'm leaving the world. And it turned into a whole full on band with youth of today. You know, I was really into the Bible too. I was really into Mm. the Bible for a while. And I think Purcell used to get mad at me. He's like, ah, it sounds too Christian. It sounds too Christian. I was like, I can't help it. I'm I'm into Christianity. And so, um, what part of it? What, what was what, what attracted you to the Bible? It's a great book. The New Testament is a great book. I actually tried to read it once. I tried to read it. Um, read, read, go home and read Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It's a great book. I grew up Catholic, so I have a natural aversion to it. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. <laughs> but I tried to read it for just what it is. And there are some interesting philosophical lessons in there. I mean, basic tenets of Christ. Love your neighbor. I know. Learn to love your enemies. Mm-hmm. Uh, forgiveness these are huge lessons Mis- i like the mix with some like mis- indian mysticism walked on water making things appear you know casting out I mean, demons is interesting i, I like the art of war a little guy better involved and if there's a mystic guy involved i find it fascinating the thing is india is just filled with all those christ-like mystics mm-hmm. you know the stuff christ was doing that was like happening all the time in india Right, like they didn't even notice him. They're just like, oh yeah, okay, come yeah, back. Yeah, yeah, you you're gonna more. levitate now. Now you're walking on water. Everyone's walking on water here. <laughs> yeah, we got like an elephant-headed guy over here, and he says you didn't walk on water. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, Ray, what do you have going on? Uh, tell our people where they can check out more of your stuff, Wisdom of the Sages. But what else are you working on? I'm working on some books. Um, what are they about? Uh, one's about just my life. Cool. And one's, one's about these six principles of bhakti yoga that help people in their material life and their spiritual life. Um, just cool principles that people can lock into. Even if they're not into spiritual life, it just makes you your life happier. Um, and they're just ancient principles sort of excavated for modern culture. Uh, then working on my, my story. And then I'm working on... Uh, a book for our podcast. Our podcast has a huge cult following of people. Not, I, mean, I don't know what huge is relative, but you no, get like 10 to 15. Cult 000. stuff. Yeah. 10 to 15. More we do it every, we do it every day. We got about 10 to 15,000 people that listen every day. That's a good number. That's a good number, right? Yeah. That's a great number. That's enough to maybe take over a small town, you know, really aggressively <laughs> lobby the local election. Cult leader. I'm guessing, great, I guess you haven't seen that. Have you seen that Netflix uh, thing? Where, what's no. that called, Bill? All right, why don't you guys just text me something to watch so I don't waste <laughs> my time? It's, there's too many options. I'll like, I don't want to invest an hour and a well, half if something's bad. It's called you like just Wild. write a little list and you text it to me. It's called like Wild West or what is oh, it? Oh, that, that, was, that was the one with Osho. Well, wild, wild country. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that's Osho's story. I won't text you that one because I'm worried you might replicate it and you'll be the leader. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get those tacky Rolls Royces, though. Get those mus- muscle cars. Um, uh, what am I into? Uh, yeah, Wisdom of the so Sages, Wisdom autobiography. Sages was, doing a, was doing a book, and I do that podcast every day. Um, I take groups of people uh, to India twice mm-hmm. a year, one for a training, one for a pilgrimage. Super fun. Fun part of my life. My kids come, too. And um, yeah, it's just been off. It's just been off because of COVID. It's like ruined my whole income. So yeah, yeah, a lot of anything that had to do with live events got hit pretty hard. I have a question oh, yeah. that just popped in my head. I think I feel I feel like I saw a picture of you one time uh, on one of these pilgrimages playing a, an instrument. But I feel like it was like an it looked like an you know traditional Indian instrument, and you guys were all chanting. But I feel like you had a sticker on there that said DMS. 
Am I right about that? A deli music shop. Uh, <laughs> I know. Every, every hardcore kid knew was thinking, what? And every Indian was going, yes, DMS, the best. Uh, Del, deli musical store, deli music stores. But okay, yeah, I, it's my, it's my harmonium, preferred harmonium of choice. I'm glad you, you clarified that. I was like, that is a really interesting uh, contrast of philosophies there. <laughs> <laughs> that's great everybody says that all right uh ray i can't thank you enough for coming on the podcast please come great. back soon and Keep up the uh good work, guys. Yeah, when you when you get the uh when you get the well, books done you should come back that would have sucked yeah. or, or it might have been more interesting we're two straight edge hardcore punk kids why would we hate you well they didn't they didn't tell me that well a lot of straight edge kids hate me and a lot of uh hardcore kids hate me it's just like the, the world i deal with either people are pretty you know they're pretty respectable or they want to kill me we make fun of a lot of people, but we make fun of them because we love them and because we're huge fans of the music. So, um, uh, yeah. So let us know when your autobiography comes out and you can come back on and, and tell our people about it. Thank you, sir. I will. And you can follow me on R- Raghunath Yogi, R-A-G-H-U-N-A-T-H, Yogi. That's, that's me. That's my, that's my brand. That's my name. Now people know me by, no one knows me as Ray anymore it's pretty interesting if you know me by ray that means you're from my past life sort of everyone just calls me ragu my wife calls me ragu my mom calls me ragu everybody calls me ragu now so as soon do as some, you- do some people like find out like you know they like google you and like wait you played in these bands for this all many the years time, yeah. all the time i get yoga people are like wait a second <laughs> stuff like that i get that wait a second thing so many times matter of fact yeah i was just uh call my daughter goes to a my daughter just started a new school this year like a a girl's private school and uh, i was talking to one of the faculty members and he's like okay thank you raganath for calling really appreciate it and blah blah blah. he goes i gotta ask you a question (laughs) (laughs) do you know or are you ray capo (laughs) it's one of those things (laughs) i grew up listening to you i get that uh, one time uh, I could, I could. I wish I had a list of every time I got one of those because it's usually something like that. Like I'm renting a car from Hertz. Okay, Mr. Kappa, we're gonna check you out on a one eight hundred number. Okay, Mr. Kappa, we're gonna check you out right now. Uh, Mr. Kappa, um, before I get off the phone with you, your car is gonna be ready at LAX. But I just want you to know, did you know there's a famous person named after you or named with the same name as you? I was like. Oh, I'm I'm so naive. I'm like, there is who? He's like, well, he was in a band. I was like, oh, wait a second. You mean like better than a thousand or youth of today? And he's like, hold on a second. Hey, Charlie, I'm talking to Ray Capo. <laughs> it's one of those things that most people don't recognize you, but when they do, they're ready to like wet their pants. I like I like that the one guy asked you, "Are you or do you know Ray Capo?" I know, <laughs> like I know. you're a guy who just like, you're like actually I I know Ray I know Capo's him, brother. Yeah, I know him so well that I started to look like him. It's crazy. Uh, <laughs> uh, all right, brother. Well, it was good talking to you. Uh, come Thanks. back soon. Keep up and the work, I'm, uh, good work, guys. I'm wishing Thank you well you. on your podcast and books. 